Thank you for having me, Chris. I, I feel a little bit like the farmer who entered his mule in the Kentucky Derby. And somebody asked him, do you, don't, you don't expect me to win, do you? He said, no, but he'll be in good company. And I have some great company in Dr. Don Young, Did Young and uh, Frank Sherwin. I had a creation conference in Beaverton that I started in 1986 and at Beaverton Church of Nazarene, and Dr. DeYoung was there. I met Frank Sherwin down in the Kachina Bridge in Utah looking at a petroglyph. And part of my educational odyssey, I attended nine different universities and colleges. I started out as a track star at the University of New Mexico a long time ago. Uh, at the University of New Mexico, Western New Mexico University, Pasadena College, back to the University of Mexico, Point Loma Nazarene University, BA, MA, Nazarene Theological Seminary. Then I went to several seminaries, United States International University too, to study for psychology and a PhD in the University of South Africa. But I have a simple belief, you know, that God, when he's calling you, there will be little things along the path that will open doors for you. I started a church in Santee, California in 1979, and I was opposed to ICR because I was a theistic evolutionist. But at the same time, I went on a uh, trip with my dad to Chicago, Chaco Canyon, the Anastasi ruins in the, the desert of New Mexico. And New Mexico looks like 200,000 square miles of kitty litter. And in that area, I picked up a book um, by Fred Barnes on, on Indians, the Anastasis. And there's a few pages in the back about petroglyphs and pictographs, rock art writings and rock art carvings of the Anastasi, and a few more unexplained. And one of them was about a dinosaur down at Kachina Bridge. Another was about mammoths and a flying reptile. So I had that book. I was pastoring a large church in Beaverton, Oregon, Beaverton Church, Nazarene, and people wanted me to have a creation speaker. And I was, didn't want that to happen, but... Reluctantly, I let uh, Don Chitty come. Some of you probably know him. And uh, he spoke, and when he spoke about dinosaurs and man, it triggered the memory of having that Anastasi book about them. And I went to Utah in 1979 and, uh, and went to that petroglyph. And then I've traveled the world looking for evidence for dinosaurs and man living together. I'm a supernaturalist. I believe this that I'm sponsored by the living God. Tiger Woods was sponsored by Nike. Kobe Bryant was sponsored by Spalding Basketball. Dale Earnhardt was sponsored by NASCAR. I'm sponsored by the living God. And that means when you're sponsored by the living God, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and the stops of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He has a plan for everyone, and in that plan, part of his plan was me to find this evidence about dinosaurs and man living together. Well, let's go to the first thing of the creationist timeline. We we'll say 6,000 years ago, the earth was formed, and about 4,000 years ago, 4,400 years ago, was the worldwide flood, 2,000 years ago, approximately Jesus. And then the, what is the evolutionist time, timeline? Their timeline is about 20 billion years ago, everything started by a big bang, that the universe was the size of a dot at the end of a sentence. That's some giant trash compactor, isn't it? I think uh, the only big bang God knows about is uh, Satan bumping his head on the way to the pit. But, and then about four, six billion years ago, you have the universe roaming, and then we have, uh, can you see, let's see where we are. You can't see that up there, can you? I still can't see it. What am I doing wrong? Hmm. Chris, what? What? Okay. okay, we were doing the timeline. All right, we had the craziest timeline, 6,000. You, you're familiar with it. 6,000 years ago, the world approximately was created. 4,400 years ago, there was a worldwide flood. 
2,000 years ago just, and then to today. And then, of course, the evolutionist is going to go back and say 20 billion years ago was the Big Bang, and about 4.6 billion years ago was the Earth was formed, and then 3.5 billion years ago, approximately life formed, and then around 3 million years ago, man came upon the scene. But the co-occurrence of dinosaurs and man, such an association would dispel an earth of vast antiquity. The entire history of earth, including the day of creation, could be accommodated for in the seven biblical days of the Genesis myth. Evolution would be vanquished. You know, evolution would be kaput. It would be like a zero with the hubcaps kicked off. It would be totally obliterated according to Lewis Jacobs in his book, African Genesis. So if we find evidence that every, uh, dinosaurs and man lived together, then that means creationism is true. 900 AD, there was an Irishman who saw his description of what we would call a stegosaurus, the plates on the back, the nail, big iron spikes at the back of the tail, and his horse-shaped head, and claws. Any reasonable person would say, he saw a stegosaurus. Marco Polo, I have his books. When he went to China, he talked about seeing the dragons. And he describes them about being 30 meters long, about 30 feet long today in today's terms. And the claws, the long tail. And I find it very vivid that he talked about their eyes like a large penny loaf of bread. If you ever see a penny loaf of bread, what it was in England in that period of time, it's about this big, which we know about dinosaur eyes today. They would have large eyes. Some species. In 1611, the emperor of China, he had the dragon uh, people who took care of those and uh, the eggs and so forth. And then in Turlock, France, Turlock, France, the description of what seems to be a triceratops that was killed. Now, the word dinosaur was invented in 1841 by Sir Richard Owen. It means terrible lizard. I like compound words. For instance, cosmetic is a compound Greek word. It means to bring order out of chaos. When women put on makeup, they're bringing order out of chaos. All right. The next one is auditorium. It's a Latin word. Audios to hear and Taurus the bull. That's when the other people are speaking, maybe not the our speakers here, but someone else. Uh, sanctuary, sanctuary, spirit, place of spirit, place of truth. But Sir Richard Owen uh, coined the term dragon. And then there's little Danny the dinosaur. He says, Daddy, they say that we didn't exist with man. And he says, his dad says, but Danny, they're lying about us. It's right here in the Bible. We were together with man. Now, Tanim, Tanim is translated 34 times in the King James dragon. Remember it pitifully buffeted Job when he was covered with boils and scraping them with pot shards and crying out of his abysmal misery, the woeful refrain of why, why, why? And God answers him and says, Stand up to me like a man. And then he gives him seven chapters of science questions. He said, have you been to the constellations, what we call Pleiades? Have you, been, have you been to the fountains at the bottom of the deep of the ocean, the currents down there, which the submarine Alvin in 1971 discovered off the Bermuda Trench at 30,000 plus feet, nearly six miles deep, they found the vents of the ocean coming forth. He says, stand up to me like a man. Of course. Uh, Job had lost everything. You know, he lost his family and his goats and sheep and cattle. He had a stock market crash, his property. And you know, he, where are you going to find joy in the midst of that, in your loss? Uh, another little, little compound word. When happiness happens to happen happily, then we're happy. When happenings happen to not happen happily, we're unhappy. So when happenings are happening happy, we're happy. When they're not happening happening like we want to happen, we're unhappy. See, 
Happiness is a compound word if you happen to be standing in the right circumstances. You got a good job, got your health, but joy is a byproduct of the relationship with the Lord. So his last challenge in this series, he asked him, he says, Behold now the behemoth of my man along with you, how he eats grass like an ox. What strength is in his loins? What power in the muscles of his belly? His tail sways like a cedar tree. What strength is in his loins? His bones are like tubes of bronze. His legs are as iron. He's the chief of all my creation. Now, you'll notice in some Bibles, the behemoth, or King James Dragon, they'll put in the side notes, they will say it, it is a hippopotamus or an elephant. Now, what I like about there are theologians who believe the Bible's inspired in spots, and they're inspired to spot the spots, and others are inspired to spot the spots they didn't spot. You know, it's a Dalmatian deity, a spotty scripture. It's not spotty scripture, it's spot on. You see, they think it's a holy Bible, H-O-L-E-Y. And so you got Pastor Nutty Buddy at Temple Simply Divine Macadamia Fellowship <laughs> and Dr. Fungusfoot and Dr. Whistlebritches. They sprinkle some academic goofy dust on it, semantical subterfuge and conversational camouflage at Ego Academia, and they try to make it all disappear. Well, it's all equally inspired. It's not all equally interesting because he said... He showed him the behemoth. And then in Job chapter 41, he said what? He said, look at, look at this. Out of his, the other animal he pointed to in Job 41, he said, out of his nostrils, there's smoke like a kettle, boiling water. And then he says, when he speaks, it's like coals of flame and fire shoots out of his mouth. You know, I really believe in my Bible, there's a fire-breathing dragon. <laughs> <They're>... <laughs> wow. I'm about to go Pentecostal. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so you're still awake. Okay, I like to have fun. Do you like to have fun? Good. So he talked about his loins and the strength of his belly. Now, elephants have a big belly. Hippopotamus has a big belly. He has a big belly. Sauropod. He has a big belly. So does he. He's in my ballet class. <laughs> okay. Oh, so he said he moved his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones, a reptile, I tell you. So you ever see a cedar tree? I'm going to grow an, a big plantation of cedar trees in Oregon. Uh, well, once I found out they can grow there. I've seen cedar trees several times in Israel. But they're about 30 feet tall, and then they come to a sharp point. So if you're going to describe a, a dragon, which is a dinosaur, his long tail would fit like a cedar tree. Now, elephants, they don't have a tail like a cedar tree. Hippopotamus, stubby tail. Hippopotamus, compound Latin word, water horse. Not like a cedar tree here either. So the footnotes, they're not inspired. His bones are strong pieces of brass. His bones are like a bars of iron. So here's a, this is not a real brachiosaurus, though, but it is a cast of just part of it. Now that's huge, isn't it? Still awake out there? So this is Jim Jensen. I met him a long time ago in the 80s. And after he found certain dinosaur eggs that were very, very more fresh than he ever believed, uh, it, it made him go into early retirement. He, he's, he began to think that uh, the dinosaurs wasn't 65 million years ago. Well, here's a dinosaur footprint in Glen Road, Texas. There's the rest of that big. That's huge, isn't it? 
100 tons, approximately what it weighed would be 14 school buses. If he stepped on you, you'd be road pizza. You'd be deeply impressed. <laughs> so what does he say? He says he's the chief of all of my creation. I don't know what kind of... No matter how much I know God, I don't know God. I know him, but I don't know him. I don't understand him. There, there are many strange things that have happened in my life that I cannot explain that led me to where I am today. But I know he's there. And yet, he's suffering, and he gives him science questions. He's the chief of all creation. What we read in God's Word, we can see in God's world. Now, if the Bible's true, then I ought to be able to go to Israel and find evidence of dinosaurs and man living together. Who would agree with that? Okay. Split, split vote. Well, here's Um el Kanatar, which was destroyed in 749 uh, A.D. It was a candle wick town, which would be very prosperous because they made the candle wicks for oil lamps. And it's the only intact synagogue with a bema seat, the judgment seat. And there in the ruins, I was there a few years ago, only a few people have been into that ruin. And on the column, remember they talk about the dragon and the lion together in Ezekiel? There's a Krylophosaurus on the column of the synagogue, Syrian region, 400 to 700 A.D. Let's see if we can. You see, you see the Krylophosaurus? See the distinctive head crest? Da, da, da. There's a tail back here. Part of it's broken off. It has three toes. It has a hind claw here. Here's a lion attacking a horse. Ex uh, Ezekiel 29.3 talks about the dragon down in the river. It's also known as the Elvisaurus because of the distinctive head crest. It has three-toed feet, has the three-toed feet, and it has a hind claw. Cryolophosaurus. Now, Jesus was in Nazareth, and Sepphoris was a Roman place just about four miles from Nazareth. I'm sure that Jesus went to Sepphoris in his lifetime. But uh, on the top of a hill there, there's a Roman villa from 200 A.D. And in the bottom of the floor, there's a mosaic floor, and I happened to jump down there and, and be very close to it and take some pictures many years ago. And at this synagogue, at the synagogue, but this Roman villa house, it's dedicated to the Roman god of wine. You know who the, uh, uh, not the Roman god of wine, but the Greek god of wine. Dionysus, you know who? That's the Greek god of wine. The English name Dennis, my name is Dennis, that comes from the Greek god of wine, but I don't live up to my name. They're still awake. There's this guy, he was, he was driving, driving erratically, and the highway patrolman pulled him over, and he said, you've been drinking? He said, no. He said, what's, what's that in that jug over there? He said, it's water. He said, let me have a taste of it. The policeman took a taste of it. He said, it's not water, it's wine. And the man said... He did it again. All right. So at the, at this, on this mosaic floor, there's a Taurosaurus. And these men are throwing spears and rocks at it. See the better picture? All right. Ernst Meyer. Creationists have stated that if dinosaurs and men were contemporaries in time, time uh, the names of the individuals would... Uh, go through the corridors of time as making one of the most important discoveries of the 20th century. Such a momentous, momentous statement were true. The names of its discoverers would thunder down the corridors of time as individuals who had made one of the most important discoveries of the 20th century. Do you hear that? Do you hear that? The applause in my head. Ernst Meyer's debate with Dwayne Gish. All right. So many, many of you will know this about the medical pathologist. It, the woman did not find it first. There was a veterinarian who saw the dinosaur bone cut of a T-Rex. And inside, he pointed out to her that, look here. Here is red blood cells. 
And so she took it back to the laboratories and she began to work on it. And they later made more discoveries about it. So there's T-Rex blood, the spongy tissue. Now, I, I've done a lot of work with mummies in Peru. And there's mummies that are 500 years old and they look perfectly preserved because you have their skin and their eyeballs, everything still there. And yet you can't get a DNA sequence. You can't get blood out of them. And uh, I've tried with different laboratories uh, to get some DNA tests. So Mary Schweitzer did this. Now, she claims to be a Christian, and I don't doubt she is. On her wall in her office, she has uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans for your life, the plans for good and not for evil to give you a hope in the future. But you see, just because people say they believe in God, in our day and age, most denominations believe in a word within a word, a canon within a canon. That the Bible is not accurate in matters of science. It's not accurate in matters of history. It's not accurate in necessarily in matters of philosophy. It's only soteriological accurate. It is that it's accurate in salvation. And most denominations in America believe that. And uh, so, but they're having a hard time explaining how you can find this in dinosaur bones. One of the experts said, we know absolutely nothing about preservation, that something could be preserved for 63 million years. Hey, you better come outside from outside before a meteor hits you. All right, Dr. Mark Armitage, he also found in Triceratops. By the way, I'm only one of a handful of people in the world that knows there was no such thing technically as a triceratops. You'll have to come tomorrow and hear what I have to say about it. All right, I was involved. This is uh, uh, the iguanodon. And this is how they thought it looked in 1840. This is about 1870. This is around 1910 to 1970s. This is about 1980. This is correct. These are the progressions. So here's in, um, they even put the claw in the wrong place. This is in Hyde Park in England in the 1840s. These, these great uh, monuments were made of what they thought the iguanodon looked like. Completely wrong. So this is the next thing that how they thought it looked like. Completely wrong. 1878, iguanodon mass grave found in Belgium. Uh, wrong again. 1970s, Iguanodon, uh, this was painted. 1971, Darling Geist puts this. But there's a place in Acambaro, Mexico, that I first studied when back in the 60s, uh, when I was in junior high, and I had different material. And I have the most material about Acambaro, it's just north of uh, Mexico City, about 200 miles. And then in the uh, 1990s, I went there and went through the collection. In fact, there are over 20,000 of these figurines. Let me show you the next one. This is the Acaparo figurine. This right here, it's not Chipicro, but Acaparo. And you see Iguanodon is correct. It's, the, the figure is correct. And this is from that collection. There were over 30,000. How it began was uh, uh, Voldemort Jolesward was riding his horse up on a place called Toro Mountain. And he looked over and he saw a piece of pottery. And out of that, he recognized uh, an extinct species of horse. In fact, the horse species was later identified as so rare, Owen Cavernus from the Ice Age. And then they found teeth later in the same area of that species of horse. But out of that, he amassed a collection and he paid somebody which be equivalent to about 20 cents for each piece. Now, you couldn't make a piece for 20 cents back in those days, as, as exquisite as some of these are. So it was not made by one man. And there's over 30,000 of them. And I have pictures of the remaining collection, over 20,000. I have some of the Alcamparo figurines that I own. And part of that 
There are over 300 different species of dinosaurs. These were found from 1945 to 1954, and in those things, there are many dinosaurs that weren't discovered until the 1970s, 80s, 90s, and even today. And how do you explain that they were able to see those make those figurines anatomically correct unless they saw the living, breathing dinosaur? Or unless Homo mexicanus from Mexico is a superior species of humanity and they have ability to see into the future. Well, this is a Japanese, it's poor, but this is a Japanese film that was made in 1997 and they came across this dinosaur that they only found in a Japanese dinosaur book. Hmm. Well, there's lots of these I have. Okay, the Akamara figurines. More than 600 dinosaur figurines are currently in the collection. In 1954, there was an official archaeological excavation, and the head of uh, the National Mexican Archaeological uh, Society, uh, he was still living the last time I was there in 1997. He was one of the excavators in part, and part of that thing, and they went to a spot of their own choosing. And when they went there, when they dug, they found dinosaurs, figurines. And as a consequence of that, they, saw, they put this in the report, in spite of the legitimacy of the find, it just can't be true. Now, Lowell Harmer, I have lots of interesting things at my house. Lowell Harmer, he was a reporter for Los Angeles Times. He went there in 1955 and 56 filming on the old, old eight millimeter cameras, they went out and they dug in different places. One place they dug, as they dug down as he filmed, in the tree roots, intertwined in the tree roots, deep in the ground, they found some dinosaur figurines. Well, I have all that, I hope I live longer. Every time an old person dies, it's like a library burning down. I hope I'm able to get some of this stuff published. All right, so here's some, they also had uh, the dinosaurs Okay, why did they put dermal spines on them back in the 1940s? That wasn't discovered until 1992, Stephen Zirkus. And it didn't even change the textbooks until even currently some of the textbooks are wrong. But it started changing in the early 2000s about the textbooks. Parasophilus, I have that correct? All right, we mentioned the fire-breathing dinosaur, Job 41. This is a petroglyph in the middle of nowhere in Arizona. You have to hike about 30 miles into the desert, and there are these petroglyphs. I'm part of a team that has cataloged more than 8 million petroglyphs around the world. And uh, uh, occasionally among those we find dinosaurs. But this is the Wapaki Indians who were there from 700 AD. And you can tell petroglyphs are older because of the pitting. See the pitting? There's pitting. It, they pit when you chip it. They use hammer stones or they use deer antlers with hammer rocks. And uh, as they made it, they chip. But then it erodes in an age. And they have a fire breathing dinosaur there by the Wapaki Indians. This is a vase, Chimu culture, 1200 AD in Peru. And on that vase is a fire breathing dinosaur. It's a little bit stylized with a tumi on top of its head, but there it is. Now this is down in New Mexico, <clears throat> the Hernoda Indians. When I was young, I was flying to California and I was on an airplane, and a little old lady was sitting next to me, she said, young man, where are you going? She said, I'm go I said, I'm going to San Josie and El Cajon. She said, here it's pronounced with an H, it's El Cajon and San Jose. She said, how long are you gonna be there? I said, oh, until Hoon or Hanuary. All right. So uh, Javier Hoon, when he played for the St. Louis Cardinals, he had a little boy and, and a baby was born. And the announcer said, what are you going to name him, Javier? He said, Javier Hoon. All right. So the Hornada Mogollon Indians, uh, this is near Three Rivers, New Mexico. And I grew up in, down in Alamogordo and by the White Sands Missile Range. And at this one site, there's over 20 plus thousand of, of these petroglyphs rock art carvings, done by Lamarna. And on one place, you see, here's a deer. Not stylized, but you can tell that's a deer. See this crest? See the distinctive eyes? See the stripes? 
see the teeth, see the uprise, the tail, the legs. It looks similar to a Parasophilus dinosaur. Look at the eyes. If you were to get close to this and look at the eyes, you will see this very similar the way they made the eye socket. Parasophilus dinosaur. Well, this is Dr. Stephen Myers, not at the Design Institute. This is another Stephen Myers. He says paleontologists uh, said that no dinosaurs had stripes like a zebra, and the Indian could not have seen it anyway. Dr. Swift is a well-meaning but ignorant creationist. He should leave the dinosaur research to us experts. My, my mother used to have a saying about experts. X has been spurred a little bit. All right, so July 2007, he said this. Now, that's, 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 those are, okay. Now, I took this here in Seattle today. A little closer, a little closer. Those are fighting words. Okay, Glenn Cuban and other evolutionists say creationists Dennis Swift and Don Patton are mis misidentifying squirrels, deer, turtle, lizards, uh, mislabeling them as dinosaurs. Oh, yeah, okay. Anyone can see clearly they are not dinosaurs. They don't look like dinosaurs. Scientists have proven dinosaurs became extinct 62 million years ago. Oh, okay. Uh, it's just a chipmunk with a bushy tail. And you've got to always be alert and, and then wait. Perhaps what you're looking for will find you. Okay, all right, all right. Do not feed the bears, all right, I got that. That's, 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 uh, that's a deer, I got it, got it, okay. Now, this is the best piece of fossilized hadrosaurus skin, which was found about nine years ago. They took it to Seattle to the sea uh, scan machine. Boeing aircraft, and I like my doctor. If I can't uh, afford the operation, he touches up the x-rays. But your x-ray showed a broken rib, but we fixed it with Photoshop. So the mummified C-scan that they used, look what they found. Oh, stripes like a zebra. Look at that. Oh, the most right, right, yourself, and Dr. D.L. Swift, Swami Swift, the grand potentate, premier, emir, cardinal, ordinal, grand poopa of the Presbyterian pyramid. Just call me the bishop. On that one, I had it right, and I could go for two or three minutes on my titles. Amen. All right, next. Well, this is the same Hornota site. Here's an armored fish. It's supposed to be extinct 220 to 410 years, million years ago. Now, here's what I believe. I believe the supernatural call of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit speaks and prompts you, that's when you move. And the day that after 9-11, in 2001, I felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit. I booked an airline ticket. I flew to New Mexico. I got a renter wreck, a rambling wreck from Georgia Tech, the total loss from Holy Cross, and the crying shame from Notre Dame. It was like being in a car embodied in a bowl of jello, all the shocks. And I went towards the area of three rivers. And I arrived at this spot, and because I believe in the supernatural, and I asked a question to this man, and he said, I asked him about dinosaur petroglyphs, and he said, oh, there was a guy named Lefty. Many years ago, he was riding his horse out there by the petroglyphs, and he said he saw a Godzilla petroglyph. <laughs> if I'd have came a day before or the day after, I'd have missed him. Uh, so I'd really believe. So here's the Hornada Malt Petroglyphs. There's 24,000 of them, as I mentioned. So some of them are stylized, but you can tell that's a deer. Camasaurus dinosaur. If you can look closely, you'll see a Camasaurus dinosaur done by the what these uh, Hornada Malt going into. Okay. <laughs> Evidence in plain sight. This is the mochi mask. See, see the, the uh, dermal spines on the back? And that's about 800 A.D. This is Peru, Paracas. Uh, the Paracas people, they inhabited this area, the Conehead people. Uh, they are, they're not from aliens from space. They're not a hybrid species. They're not offspring of the Nephilim. In fact, I own, my mama used to say, get ahead in life, Dennis. I own a Conehead, and it has his red hair. They're all red-haired people, and they're all short, so they couldn't be part of the Nephilim, and they're only about this big. And so I have a Conehead, and I took the sample, and we're doing research to find the DNA of what people group the Conehead people were. So this, they had these distinctive cone heads. I'm rushing now. I'm going to get through this stuff. So this is a Paracas vase from about 300 B.C. See the dinosaur with dermal spines on it? 
I own that. Thank you, Jesus. This piece right here, it's a mantelpiece that's put on a mummy. Oh, see? And if you smell this, it'll smell as a mummy. If you've been in a mummy in a tomb, when it's closed, it's sealed, it doesn't rain there, you look down there, the people's flesh is still there. Sometimes their eyeballs are staring at you. Well, this, no pre-Columbian expert in the world will doubt this, will question it. There might be some creationist scoffers that might, but no, no pre-Columbian expert. They know this is real. It's made out of uh, alpaca, a llama, a llama. This one's a llama. Um, and quite distinctive. So the dinosaurs are on there. All right, this vase of this dinosaur's paracas. Now, I've handled, I've seen at least a quarter of a million plus pieces of pottery, ancient pottery. Paracas, Noskin, um, Inca, uh, Mochi, Tiwanaku. Paracas, see that dinosaur? Well, look at his eyes. See these age chips? You cannot fake age chips. When a piece of pottery is old, sometimes it chips. And also, the way the ancient people made their pottery with a harangal wood and everything, nobody can make it the same exact way and look at age. They can't make it, this, it's too narrow and thin and the way they made it. And also, when they're very old, a lot of them have age chips that'll pop out the bottom. And this has a piece that popped out the bottom. This has been verified, and I happen to acquire this. And Sure, there's some museums that might offer me $100,000 plus dollars worth, but I don't take it because God gave it to me. The more evidence in the entire world for dinosaurs and man living together is at 9640 Southwest New Forest Drive in Beaver, Oregon. So there's the whole dinosaur. And look here, after this vase was found, these paleontologists don't know about it, but look at the way they drew the dinosaur that was found in 2008 in Argentina. The same distinctive eye socket over the top because they found the bone ridges. Whoa! Don't shout me down, shout me up. All right. This is Paracas. They had the finest fabrics. This is painted on with vegetable oils. You see the dinosaurs? Species of dinosaur. This is a Paracas burial cloth on the right hand. Here's a burial stone. By the way, there's a surprise coming for creationists in the next journal of creation. The editor may lose his job, bless his heart, but an article is being published, co-authored by me and David Watson about the Eka stones. I'll talk about that tomorrow. All right, so here's a stone. These are the Noskin people from about 300 B.C. to 800 A.D. Uh, they had Chinese characteristics. DNA has been tested. All American, the American Indian groups tested in the United States. 20 to 60 percent of their DNA was Chinese, except the Zuni, and some of their DNA is Japanese. And it's, uh, and, but these people had uh, Chinese-like features, and they built the great Noska lines. And as among these things, see the Chinese features? And then the Inca Ice Maiden that was found in 1996, I think, at 20,000 plus feet. Her DNA is partially uh, Taiwanese. And this is the Ice Maiden. Mochi vase, Inca features. This is a, this is Noskin. You see the dinosaurs? Also, when the mummy, I talked about this, called a burn. When you put the fabric next to the mummy, then when some of the body fluid comes out, it causes a burn, a certain distinctive stain that paleontologists who work in that kind of field of archaeology and forensic experts note this. So this is uh, from 400 to 700 AD. Dinosaur. Evolutionists are like blind farmers. They can't, they can't see the evidence. All right. This is a Noskin vase over here, and it has a stegosaurus on it. It's about four to 700 AD. 
a Noskin mantelpiece with the same dermal spines, dinosaur. Here's a child's, this is a child's poncho, Noskin. Very precious. And this is his poncho. And you see the dinosaurs on the bottom? I have a, a Inca runner I'll talk about in a second. I have his shorts, his undershorts, and he has little llamas on his. There's another. So they had to see, there's a Noskin vase with dinosaur on it. We go down to Tiwanaku Empire. Look at this vase with the dermal spines and the stripes. And that is impressive and incredible. It's astonishing. And that's from 800 to 1000 AD. I have been to the deepest canyon in the world, and it's not Grand Canyon. Kotawasa Canyon is two miles, 300 meters deep. It, you go to, when you get to the top, there's 60 volcanoes, and I climbed some of the volcanoes, 14, 50,000 feet, and there's 60 volcanoes that surround it. And deep in these hidden ravines is some of the last remnants of some of the best archaeological evidence for dinosaurs and men living together. And this, this vase right here, you see the dermal spines and you see stripes. And it appears to be a male and female dinosaur on this Tiwanakan vase. Tiwanakans were the great megalithic builders, not the Incas, the great megalithic builders. And again, it wasn't Nephilim who built these ruins up there. It was people who were small people who understood great technology. So the mummified dinosaur again shows the stripes. This is a Tiwanakan cup, and it has a dinosaur on it. This is a stone with a Amargarsaurus dinosaur found in a Tiwanakan tomb. Now, this is in the National Museum in La Paz, Bolivia, found in an official archaeological excavation. When they dug down, they found this, and this is now in the museum. I'm going to go see it in about four months. Um, now, this vase is Tiwanaku. This is a very precious artifact. 14, 1500 D. See the two dinosaurs on it in bas relief? If you smell that, you'll know it's been with the mummy. See the way the skin is? It's anatomically correct. Some of the books, and I, I buy a lot of creationist books, but some creationist books are anatomically incorrect, but it's okay. I love them. See the nose placement where the nostrils are? Other features? Well, anyway, this is fantastic. And this is absolutely fantastic. It's beyond description to me that I own these things. I just can't. I'm glad I got to come here and show them to you. All right. So you see the features on this vase. The nose placement, correct. I had to see a living, breathing dinosaur up close to get this Tiwanaku vase, Harengo wood, carbon dated, four to seven hundred A.D. This is a little piece of fabric from Tiwanaku with a dinosaur on it. Now, quickly about the stegosaurus. The spiny tripod stegosaurus in the 1890s, when they first found the skeletons, all you find is skeletons, so you don't know how to put it together. So they thought that it had all these spines along the back and some plates back here. Because every stegosaurus ever found, the plates are not connected to the body. So I will get to this. And so, in 1914, Frank Bond put the, they put the plates laying down flat and the spike sticking up like this, which is incorrect. Now, see, this is the best preserved Tiwanaku, I'm not Tiwanaku, but Stegosaurus ever found. I think they named her Sarah. So, you see, but they don't know how it's placed. One person knows. I wonder who that is. The raging controversy around the proper Stegosaurus anatomy. No fossil specimen has ever been found with the plates attached. There are three theories, single row, parallel, or spaced. Would you like to know where they really were? Okay. 
Stegosaurus, did it look like that? This is a Tianwakan water canteen. Again, let me tell you something. If you offered me $500,000, I would not take it. And some museums have offered in Peru for certain things that I have. I wouldn't give it because I move by faith. I believe God at right times. And these pit, this comes from a Tianwakan grave in about May of this year. I was there at the end of May. And it is it's just astonishing. See this? How are the plates on the Stegosaurus? The man who made this vase, 1400 to 1500 AD, put them like this on both sides. Mm -hmm -hmm. Okay, Inca Empire, I'm gonna go two more. Uh, the Inca Empire stretched 28, uh, over 3,000 miles. The Chosky runners, they ran, and the relay runners, and they had the quipus, the talking knots, and they passed them. And they could cover 3,200 miles in about 12 days. And they had runs from 2.2 kilometers up to, you know, about 20-something miles. And they also blew this horn called a patutu when they arrived. And uh, the Quechua language is still alive, but we don't know the written language. They, we, they just did these talking nights, knots. And I have a friend who knows a lot about it. This is actually, and I'm going to show you. So Chosky. Did they see a living dinosaur? Well, here's his canteen. This is Chosky canteen. He has two dinosaurs on it. And as far as I know, I'm the only person who has a Chosky uniform. I have his complete clothes, his winter, summer. I have his shoes, very small people. This is his bag right here. And these are the talking knots which he used. He would pass off to the next relay runner. I say, wow. Say that backwards, wow. So there's a couple of small ones. I have some giant ones about this big. Only around 300 of these have survived in, uh, in our time. I'm going to cover just a couple more things. I'll go past this in the Amazon. Mochi bass face. Cambodia. Oh, do I have 10 minutes? How much? One minute? What? Okay. This is in uh, Cambodia in the jungle at Tapram. I went there in 2005 and I invited Don, Pond, Don Pot Patton to come along with me. And this is how this stuff entered into creation literature. But here is it, one of the temples. You see these giant catfish? They're giant. And they're feeding these men into these big moats where there's alligators and giant catfish. Well, here's a catfish. Yeah. I don't know. See this catfish? Well, they caught this catfish in 2005, and it weighed 547 pounds. It's the size of a grizzly bear. And they estimate they get up to 800 pounds. So it's not mythical monsters. There's the giant catfish on the temple at uh, uh, the prom. And the giant freshwater stingray. And they estimate they get up to 800 to 1,000 pounds. This one is about 600 pounds. Incredible how their, their young are born. So here at the Temple of Tapram, we went there and went into the jungle, and here's the banyan trees overgrowing all the, the temple ruins. See the giant trees growing. Henry Marcel excavated this in the 1920s. As far as I know, I'm the only per I don't like to say it, but it's true. I'm the only person I know that has these photographs of this because this is 1900 to prom. Because all these skeptics, and some are creationists, and bless their little hearts, it's amazing how much unbelief, believers believe, they're unbelieving believers, they believe dinosaurs and man live together, but they just don't believe God would give anybody real evidence, total evidence. And we'll build a museum, but we won't have any evidence, but it'll be all right. Okay, so uh, to prom, this is the temple area overgrown by the jungle right where the Stegosaurus is found, to the left. And Henry Marchal excavated. See? It's the problem. And when this was excavated, 
Henry Marchell, head of the French Conservatives and anchor, he said the problem of the dinosaur on the temporal wall. When they took back all the roots, when they took back the stones, they saw the dinosaur. And that's in 1900. And so he didn't know how to explain it. And his daughter, Sophie, she wrote a little thing about it in a letter. You have to do some historical sleuthing to get to the bottom of these things. Here again, just to the left of this area is where that column is. So Don and I went in there in 2005, and there's the column, and there's the Stegosaurus. And I have a, a carved, carved by the Cambodian people the exact replica of that. So even Claude Jock. Kachina Bridge Dinosaur. 1979, I'm out there with my dad, and I get this book, and I go looking for this petroglyph. And in those days, you had to, you couldn't go there by car. Uh, you, you had to walk several miles. You couldn't come close to it. Well, see, it's on the Bartlett scale, it's the best place on the planet to see stars at night. So dark, you can see quite a canopy. So underneath the bridge, the Anastasians inhabited inhabit this thing from 300 BC to 1300 AD. They committed ecological suicide because there was a prolonged drought, but they kept cutting down the trees for firewood and stuff, so they had to move. The Anastasia are the ancient ones. They also were masters, and I'm going to show you in a minute. So I took, started taking creationists down there in the 1990s. But you see the dinosaur? Now let me explain how this is. See? See the dinosaur? See the tail? See the whole thing? Now, the dinosaur is made they first etched on the outside with a hammer stone and a chisel. They had a stone chisel, and they would cut the design. It's approximately three feet long. And then they took a deer antler tent, and they pecked it. Peck, 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 peck. But the Indians also, they always chose sites, two things, like the crack there. See this crack for its mouth? That's a natural crack in the stone. If you get up close, it has a big toothy grin. Now, the average creationist will go there. Oh, yeah, there probably is some dinosaurs just, I think. And they go down there, and they look up and go, I don't know, I can't see very good. I don't think it's that good evidence. Well, why don't you get your lazy rear up there and get a 13-foot ladder? Carry it all the way down, sir, the miles. Climb up next to it. Get a microscope. Get a proscope. I have a proscope. I, I did the whole thing with a proscope. Shh, shh, shh. Uh, inch by inch. I spent years. How did they make them? Then I get Indians. Tell me how to do it. And even they, the Indians tell me, some of them, they had a, the, what they call a cult. We call it cult, but they're like Kachina dancers, and part of them were dragon dancers. And they believed that they, they lived with these animals. So here it is. See this, this dinosaur? It's pecked out. It's got four legs, tail. Hmm. Pa Jan Cameron, she's Canadian. She was a friend of mine in the 1990s, and she studied petroglyphs. She was commissioned by the Canadian government to do rubbings of fossils because with your eyes or microscopes, there's little things you can't detect. But if you have a precise way of doing it with a rock art arboring, you can tell what is there. Would you like to see what is there? Well, I was just on French TV. Well, they edited it. Um, I was with William Shatner on the History Channel. Remember Captain Kirk? But they edited. They edited everything out that's evidence so they make you look silly at the end. Well, that's okay. I'm going to be silly for Jesus. But you see this whole thing. There is a dinosaur. And I can't develop all this stuff, but I will, I will do just a couple more things here. I don't give everything away because I'm trying to finish this second and third book. This is the leading dinosaur, I mean, is a leading petroglyph expert of her time, Polly Shaftsma. 
The canyon was not explored until 1961, the Hobler expedition. I have the original report. I also have her stuff. And Jan Cameron, when they studied it closely, and she knew rock art, she did this of it. Does that look very much like a dinosaur? That's her rock art paint, uh, drawing. So I used deer antler tints. There's the red tail. Gauges, microscopes. There's the pitting. They used the natural cracks in the rock. Can you see the head? See the. So Phil, Phil Sintner, he, he wrote an article and now it's on French TV and it's in a, in a paleontological journal. Here's what Phil Sintner says. He says, see the head? He says, it's just a deal. It's a squirrely wog and it's a mud glob down here. These aren't legs and the tail. No, the peck marks go right into the tail. And how does he know this? Because he stood down below, like some creationists, with the binoculars and looked up at it and said, oh, I can tell. It's not a dinosaur. Okay. Got you, Phil. Okay, what about, does that look like a squirrely thing right there? Does that look like a head? Does that look like, a, does that look like peck marks? Does that look like an eye? Does that look like teeth? Oh, okay. It's not a blob or a mud glob. It's a sauropod clod. Okay. So here's a rock art rubbing of it. These are the ancient Indian ladders. One of these right here in Blanding, Utah. They found ladders, and they also found deer antler tents. And then it's also used, they used a juniper berry off the trees, and they also did this. So if you look at it at certain points, earlier on, it once had a coating on this. And if you use special infrared photography, I've forgotten the guy's name, he got a great camera award for this. Um, but he, he, he helped me in this. All right, so Camasaurus. Now, when you go into the canyon, at winter solstice, Kachina Bridge, when the sun sets, the shadow comes along the wall. Because Indians were masters of placing the animals where it mimicked the sound of, of animals and also movement. So when it moves, the dinosaur looks like it's moving. There are three other dinosaurs. As it moves way up, about 60 feet, I've been up there, and there's three other dinosaurs. And when you come, it, the shadow moves. And then if you stand at a certain spot, they're called hot spots. And my wife there was with a replica Anasazi deerskin Indian drum and the queen of Beaverton, who's now with the Lord. But she'd, she'd play that, she'd hit that, that drum. And as you hit the drum, at that one spot, it surrounds stereophonic sound. And you will hear it, boom, boom, boom. It sounds like the heavy footprints of footfalls of an animal right there. And only at the one spot where they would be like this and line up. And we know from the other places, it, and I won't get into many other things that I'm writing in this book, because other places in the world, people did the same thing. I'm going to stop there. There may be a few questions. Thank you, I, Dr. Swift. Thanks for having me. All right, Dr. Swift, if you would leave your mic on, I'm going to have you close this out in a word of prayer, if you would. Just want to remind everyone that doors open tomorrow morning at 8.30. I'll start with my welcome at 8.45. Dr. D. Young is the first speaker up tomorrow morning at 9. But show up early because we'll have some breakfast items back there. And, of course, we'll have coffee and all that stuff. All right, come back tomorrow for some uh, more great talks. Dr. Swift, would you close out in a word of prayer? Uh, Father, thank you for the very gift of life. Help us to live it to the fullest and not squander it. Lord, help everyone in this room to fulfill their divine purpose. And may they have many unexpected journeys. And may they even get glimpse of eternity before they go to eternity. May angels surround them tonight. May they sense the very presence of the Holy Spirit deeply with them. And may you watch over their family in every detail and provide a breakthrough for everyone in this room. In Christ we pray. Amen.